Um, so we're really thrilled to be partnering with the Museum of Broadway um, for this one-on-one -on -one conversation. I'm Danny. I'm the director of the foundation. Um, we are the nonprofit of the Labor Union, Stage Directors and Choreographers Society. Thank you all for being here. Um, and before we jump into this conversation, I just want to thank some of our wonderful funders who allow us to do public programming like this. So that's the New York State Council on the Arts with support of the Office of the Governor and the New York State Legislature, the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the City Council and the National Endowment for the Arts, as well as SDC and many generous individuals. And I also want to thank the Maria Torres Emerging Artists Foundation. They're here filming um, and capturing today's event, which is really awesome so that not only you all can see it, but everyone else who wants to see it can watch it afterwards. So um, it's really great. So to kick off this conversation, I want to introduce Laura Penn, who will be interviewing Michael this afternoon. So Laura Penn is the executive director of the Stage Director and Choreographer Society and was recently appointed by President Biden to serve as a member of the President's Committee on the Arts and Humanities. Um, in addition to her many career accomplishments, she also serves as the co-chair of the Coalition of Broadway Unions and Guilds, which represents a coalition of 18 Broadway unions and guilds, serves as a board member on the Entertainment Community Fund, and also sits on the Tony Awards Administration Committee. So Laura, I want to welcome you to the stage, and Michael, I'll also welcome you up too, but she'll introduce you. So welcome, Michael. Welcome. Thank you. Danny. Um, before we launch into this discussion and introduction, I just want to say a couple of words about SDCF for those of you who don't know the work of the foundation. The union, SDC, was founded in 1959 by a group of Broadway directors and choreographers. In 1965, this is a story many people don't know, a group of those same founders said, you know, we need a space to talk about craft. Being a director, being a choreographer at times can be a lonely profession because you're often the only one of you in a room, co-directing and co-choreography um, notwithstanding. Um, and so how do we create that space to advocate uh, for the work, to exchange information, and to recognize that it's an apprentice craft? And so the foundation was created. So Danny is the uh, director of the foundation. I'm the executive director of the union, but I'm a proud trustee on SDF's, SDCF's board. So I just thought I'd give that a little more context for the foundation. And you have your um, programs in front of you, which give you um, the bio of Michael Arden, which I will not read uh, word for word, except to say uh, he is and you know, this is a sequence specific to SDC and SDCF. He is a director, and he's an actor, and he's a composer, and he's a writer, and you know, he even has spent time uh, designing as I understand. So, and has, you've seen his work here in New York and across the country, an extraordinarily gifted um, artist. Here is how I'd like to organize our conversation, if I might. Um, uh, loosely around a bit of an introduction to your path as a director, uh, care about how you've shaped your career to date. Um, I'd like for us to talk a little bit about your rooms, what your rooms look like, what your maybe fields and parking lots look like, um, and if there's time maybe we can touch on what's next, but want to make sure we have uh, time for some Q&As in the room. And we want to leave on time, which is going to be about 8 p.m. tonight. <laughs> so that's a lot to talk about. Um, so, uh, in in looking at a body of work for a director or choreographer, we like look for the I, I look for the path. Like, how did they get from here to there? And it's never a straight line. It's always there's some uh, uh, twists and turns. But yours is particularly hard to uh, track. Sort of what came first what came next, how you leaped from one piece of your work to another. I understand that you came to theater as a young person, clearly some measure of talent and commitment, um, some and acting as well as other um, areas of expertise. But beginning with acting, can you tell us about the three most formative performance experiences you had? Oh goodness. Um, well, I started, I, I fell in love with theater, like you said, very young, and I was lucky enough to have an incredible community theater 
in my hometown of Midland, Texas, where um, baby Jessica fell down the well there, if you know where that is. That's, that's sort of all we had, uh, except a really fan fantastic community theater. So I'd probably say, kind of putting that entire experience as, as one, because uh, I had a place to go after school. I had, uh, it was my first experience with other artists in a space. Um, I was part of a youth theater company called the Pickwick Players there, and so that was sort of, that was a very formative time. It's like how I learned about everything I knew about theater. I watched the Tonys for the first time with that group. I uh, took a trip to New York to see my first Broadway show with that group. So being a part of that company was very important, and I actually, there are a few people from that company, one in particular, a guy named Matt Hinckley, who is a Broadway orchestrator and music director now, who he and I, he and I were in that together at the same time in Midland, Texas, and so that's exciting that he's, he's now making work. So that would be one, I would say two, would probably be my um, Broadway debut as an actor, which was in the Deaf West revival of Big River. Um, I was an acting student at Juilliard, and I did what I was not supposed to do, which was go to an audition. Um, I skipped a class one day and went to an audition for Big River. Um, I was asked to learn some sign language for this audition, having known zero, um, and ended up getting the role of Tom Sawyer in that, and it was just supposed to run until the end of the summer, and I was going to be able to go back to my junior year at school, but we extended, and. I had to make the decision whether to stay with the production or and leave school or vice versa and I decided to continue my education on the streets of New York as opposed to in at Lincoln Center uh, so that I would say is number two that that really that and the experience in Texas both kind of cracked open for me um, pools of people and artists that I hadn't been in contact before so I guess that would be the through line. I mean, with it was theater folk to begin with in Texas and here. It was the deaf community and the Broadway community. And uh, it's been an important part of my life as an artist and human since then, which I am so, so grateful that was my first experience. I mean, to be on Broadway is incredible. To be playing a role like Tom Sawyer, actually Big River was the first musical I ever saw too. So it actually then was my first Broadway show We'll get into more of that later, but um, so that was a very exciting experience. I feel so blessed to not only have been given an opportunity to be on Broadway as an actor, but to be required to learn something kind of quite difficult. And um, I think a any opportunity you have to learn while you work is the best opportunity you can have. So that would be two. And three as an actor, um, goodness. I would probably say um, working on The Hunchback of Notre Dame musical was the last musical I was in and that was a few years ago and I was directing Spring Awakening at the same time as I was doing that in LA uh, in a small theater and so I was running back and forth between the two and um, that was just an incredible experience because it was like the best role anyone could ever play. And I was working with Alan Menken and Stephen Schwartz and Scott Schwartz and uh, Chase Brock, incredible team. So I, that's sort of as I was transitioning and starting to be a director. So I think I was like noticing things that I, I, I hadn't, thinking about things that I hadn't necessarily been required to as an actor before. I think as an actor, there's sort of, it's required that you, you force yourself to be negligent of, of certain perspectives. Uh, you know, you can only, you can't see the play as Quasimodo. You have to just see what Quasimodo sees through his one eye. <laughs> so um, it, I, that was an important, I think, moment in my life because I was beginning to, to sort of say, oh, I, I, I love being able to see through many people's perspectives. And that, that ranges from you know, your early, uh, you as a youth too, so recent, is fantastic to 
here. I'm going to maybe press you to try to answer this, which might seem strange given your answer to that. But I'm going to ask you about the directors you worked with as an actor mm -hmm. and how they, what, what you carried with you or what you now reflect back on that maybe you experienced as an actor that has informed your work or that you find um, comes to mind occasionally. And so we'll start with Jeff Calhoun, who you worked with on Pippin in 2003, and then again, I'm sorry, Big River in 2003 and Pippin in 2009. Yeah, Jeff has been very, I, I owe so much of my career, I mean everything to Jeff for hiring me in my first Broadway show where I kind of, one of those three experiences. So I learned so much from him. I think I learned that um, there's music in everything from Jeff. He, th he thinks so musically in his staging and he is, he loves fun. And so his sense of fun and kind of wonder at what actors are able to do and um, that theater can be a musical endeavor, no matter if it's a musical or not, I learned from Jeff. And so that was, he's someone who's very special to me. Um, I also had the, can, can everyone hear me okay? Okay, great. Um, I had the great privilege of working with uh, Trevor Nunn, who sort of became my mentor, I guess, as it were. I would, I would say that to him. And I continue to meet with him once or twice a year and uh, grill him as much as I can about the classics and how he, what he would do in certain situations that I find myself in. And uh, so he would be someone who I worked with as an actor and his, his attention to detail and um, is like none other. And also I think he kind of taught me that, that naturalism doesn't mean less than it doesn't mean a, a deadening of the world it actually like if you walk out on the street you see how insane everything is and that's nature so I, I it's sort of I got I learned that from Trevor and his and the way he cares for every department and every person and his tenderness and and uh, he makes everyone feel so special so I learned that from him I'm try I try to do that I try to be him and think like him. What would Trevor do? And I'm wearing double denim because he does every day, <laughs> probably. Um, and uh, you know, I've worked with so many great directors over the years. Um, I worked with Twyla Tharp mm -hmm. on a show called The Times They Are Changing, and I learned from her many things. One, that, that your body is much bigger than your brain. And so to engage, to engage your entire body in the work and sometimes don't lead with the brain is something I, I learned from her as a performer. Um, and that you can work from many directions. You can work from the inside out and from the outside in and both are valid. Uh, and just a sense of work ethic that is on, I mean, I, I, I will never be as hard of a worker as Twyla Tharp, so, uh, you know, she's, doing push-ups somewhere right now, I'm sure. <laughs> so uh, I, I learned that, you know, I, I, I envy her, her self-discipline and her rigor. But Kristen Hange on Bear. Kristen Hange, I think I learned from her uh, that every, at the root of every situation and every endeavor should be love, actually. She said that the, the first, day of rehearsal for a bear. I, I'm trying to remember now, oh my God. Uh, she said, Every, everything we do comes from love or the lack thereof. And so it's either an exploration of or a search for love. And that's something I learned from Kristen. Beautiful. Was the last performance you gave, was that in King Lear? Was that with yeah. Sam Gold? With Sam Gold. The last so you have been directing. I had been directing, yeah. So how was that with Sam? It was fascinating. I mean, I had, I'm had i such a fan of Sam Gold's work, and I had wanted to work with him, and this opportunity came up. They were looking for someone in King Lear who could interpret uh, into sign language and who felt comfortable speaking and doing Shakespeare, and I thought, that's me. I want to do that. I want to do that. And I begged to audition, and I did, and uh, and... 
it was exciting watching him work because he is he ha his vision is so strong that he sometimes kind of wants to isn't concerned with entertaining people which I found really fascinating <laughs> which had been like was at the time really foreign to me I thought well don't don't you want to give the people what they want a little bit more especially in King Lear at times um, and and then I, I sort of understood that oh no he's really like he's on a track with with an idea and that sort of unswerving focus that he brings to his work and he doesn't pander is so admirable and difficult to do for me as a director I think I often want to like give in and like put some sugar on top yeah yeah he's amazing I can't I'm I can't wait to see enemy of the people next week I know right yeah yeah that's gonna be um, so the first mention of you direct being involved in directing that I can find uh, is assisting Warren Carlyle on Tale of Two Cities, your assistant. It was 2008, and I believe you were pretty much in the center of your television acting career. And I, I, I couldn't figure out how to connect the dots from what you were doing living yeah. in L.A. to Warren. Well, I was living in New York still, so oh, I lived in L.A. Okay. for like 10 years, but kind of live nowhere and everywhere. But I had done a show at Encores, Juno, the musical Juno, which is based on Juno and the Paycock, with Gary Hines and Warren Carlyle choreographed, and I thought he was so fabulous, and I said, hey, could I ever assist you? And he said, yeah, I'm doing A Tale of Two Cities, the musical, would you like to? And so he, thank God for that, he, he let me come in the room, and uh, I got to be a part of that process. So that's how it was my first kind of time assisting a director and then I started asking people to shadow as much as possible so I shadowed some directors on both TV sets and in theater and I shadowed the some of the producers on Newsies actually and so I got to spend time throughout the tech process watching how a show was produced during tech which I learned a lot during um, I yeah, basically like, just try to ask right? everyone if I could just stalk them yeah basically, and watch what they do in all departments because I wanted to learn as much as I could about every aspect. So then Laurent. Yeah, so then I was living in LA. I was unemployed for a year, like a full year, nothing in acting. And I had a, got a job at a small gift shop in Silver Lake called the Spitfire Girl. We sold great candles and colognes, <laughs> still there. Um, and I was really, I had moved out to LA because I thought, oh, I want to, I want to do TV and film, and uh, isn't that great? And then I wasn't doing TV and film, and that wasn't great. And so, I, as I sat behind this counter, luckily we didn't have a lot of business that came through. I wrote an adaptation of Schnitzler's play *Le Ronde* for all of my unemployed actor friends in LA, and a few in New York who said they would fly out to do it if we did it, and I raise money on Kickstarter and we did this production of L.A. Ronde um, throughout a neighborhood in Los Angeles in 10 different locations and it was a mighty endeavor. We had 20 people in the company and 10 people could see it at night. So we did it for a weekend and I think like 30 people saw it, maybe 40 people. We did like four performances. The police came a couple times um, and, that, and I remember that was like the kind of aha moment of understanding that this is what I loved doing was creating spaces to work with the artists that I know and love in ways that I had seen they had not been able to work before. And when you decided to write that adaptation did you know you would be directing it? Was that? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I wanted to direct it. I know I didn't want to be in it. Mm -hmm. That I knew, and I, I knew I wanted to direct it and call on all my friends. Spencer Lift choreographed that production, um, and that's how we first started working together. Um, Alexandra Silber was in that, if you know that actor, amazing, who I went to high school with. Um, yeah, so it's just a bunch of friends getting together trying to do something um, when there wasn't a lot of anything happening, especially in theater in L.A., 
Um, and that show led directly to doing Spring Awakening. And it was site specific? Immersive. It was. It was all of the things. Site specific, immersive, illegal, all of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the audience got a postcard with a, a Polaroid of a street corner and a time. And that's all they knew. And uh, they showed up and immediately like got on a city bus and it started and it it was a, like a four hour adventure that went into motel rooms, inside back of limousines, uh, into people's backyards, alleyways, a nightclub. It was wild. It was ambitious, to say the least. Your work up to that time in the theater had been like theater. You'd been inside theaters. You'd worked um, with you know some substantial uh, folks as an actor. How did you get to the site-specific immersive piece of that? Like, I didn't have a that? theater. <laughs> I mean, I, there wasn't a theater to use, and I couldn't afford to rent one. So I talked to my roommates, and they, I said, can I use the house for like a weekend? I promise I'll put everything back. And then started, you know, asking people, can we use your alleyway? Can we use your pool? Can we rent a limousine from you? And I, I wanted to do a play in which I could make everything as possible as close to the thing it would be in life in that play. Mm -hmm. So I was trying to like remove the walls as much as possible with it. Um, all the actors used their real names. And, I, and as we developed the script, I wrote a script and then we rehearsed and I would go back and rewrite every night after we rehearsed so it became more and more like them as we went through. So I was really trying to like scrub away as much as possible so that I mean, obviously the story was manufactured and it was from the 1890s, but um, I wanted it to be as kind of close to reality as possible to kind of give the audience a, an experience they weren't used to when going to see a play. And it was the forest of art, so you started a company at that point? Yeah, I mean, it was just an, a name for it to, to be under because I, I, I was born Michael Moore, it's my real name. I obviously had to change that um, because of the wonderful documentarian and filmmaker, Michael Moore. Um, and I was, I, at Juilliard, I was doing As You Like It and had written music for the play and had written a piece of music called Into Arden when they run off to the forest. And I had put my name on it and I knew I had to change my name and I looked down and saw it there and I was like, that's a good name. And so that the forest of Arden has always been like a special thing to me and that play I love so much. I've done it like three times, um, hope to again. So that's kind of, The Force of Arden felt like a refuge for artists and certainly in LA, all these people who were hating the you know, auditions they were going on, who were, wanted to be doing theater, it seemed like the right vibe. That's so great. You know, that's another skill, which is naming things. <laughs> you know, not everybody, like some people can come up with great ideas, but like, what do you call it? Um, so. I love naming Nicely things. Done. It's like my yeah. favorite part of it, it's my favorite part of a rehearsal process when you know like when you're in a show and you're like, oh, we're gonna go back to Sunflower. You like everyone knows what that is. <laughs> the stage manager I work with on a lot of projects and I, it's our favorite part. We really mm -hmm. the naming of moments. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so the Forest of Arden then became the American. So you did the American Dream study. Now we're in. Post we're in like a horrible pandemic, pandemic like yeah. m May 2020 so I didn't do anything with that group like it was literally just something to like call the company so there really isn't a it isn't a company, it isn't a company. it's it's just like an idea um, yeah that's I'm forming a having a real company is a lot harder than I think I I'm I'm pre I'm not ready for it yet I'll call you and beg you to help me um, but in the pandemic same thing, everyone was at home, and ton, actors, dancers, and we just, I just had dreamed up this idea because I walked my dog every morning, this big two mile loop, and thought, oh, we could do a play here, outside, and so we started getting people on Zoom and creating a site-specific piece that we could do far from people. Uh, during the pandemic, and we started using a technology company called Rave, 
out of Canada that could synchronize audio and stream to people so that they could like watch a pre-recorded scene. The whole thing was lip synced. So we like wrote a play and then lip synced the entire play. Thank you, Dana H. Um, uh, yeah, we just wanted to try to make something safe and interesting and new and everyone kind of got to self-direct their own scenes just to, so that they could be doing something and making something. Fantastic. That was such a challenging time for everybody yeah. in, in our industry and you know, watching directors and choreographers, because that's what we do, um, try to find a way to express their own creativity along with anxieties and questions about the time that was happening and then support because so much of what you do is facilitate process for other collaborators. Well, right? it was also, it would have been impossible for me to like direct that mm -hmm. show. So I just kind of facilitated. And in that we learned that so many performers have so much more within them than being, you know, G g than, than, the, than they're usually allowed to do. They have so much more capability. Everyone does. I mean, we all, we all wish we could get outside of our box, so we sort of decided to remove the boxes and see what happened as an experiment. And it was incredible. I mean, there, there's now like, one of the person who had just been a dancer is now like a cinematographer because of that process. It's now like working on movies and had never thought about doing that, but got to have a camera in her hand that day or for that experience. And so I think anytime we can step out of those boxes and like try to learn something new or just be given an opportunity to do something new is, is great. So let's talk about your room, your rehearsal room and getting into the room. Uh, starting with research. Um, from what I understand, you, you like to research. You like to dig in before a process. You do some traveling. You. I love <laughs> directors because they're kind of historians. Yeah. You know, how they apply, how they find that history that they're going to apply may be different. But tell, tell us about your research process. Well, I tr if I'm doing a project that is about a specific place, I, I feel it's really important for me to like go there mm -hmm. and kind of like ask spiritual permission <laughs> a little bit. You know, I don't want to like not know what the it smells like or feels like or you know at least having spent a moment in some place so that seems like a, a given that any any director would want to do I don't know plus I like to travel so it gives me but you know an excuse to go somewhere but that's important to me um, and I mean like for parade for example like I had been to spend time in Atlanta but I all the photography of the the lynching site I took I went by myself and sat on the ground for four hours and filmed the traffic and kind of sat there thinking about the play. It also like forces me to have time to, to think. Mm -hmm. Research does, if anything, even if it doesn't like yield anything specific that I use, it like forces me to be in process. It's, uh, if that makes to, sense. You went to Haiti for once on this mm -hmm. We spent some time in Haiti, which was somewhat overwhelming and incredible and I mean the design team went as well casting director um, it was it was uh, and so almost everything you saw on stage was direct reference for things we learned and saw and documented there Lincoln Center Library you visit the Lincoln Center Library. I know you're going to think, oh my God, she stalks me. But um, I understand you've, you've taken advantage of the Yeah, well, and when I was a student at Juilliard, I used to go all the time too. They had to be like, no, you've seen that one already. Because <laughs> you can only see things once, I think. Yeah, it's, well... I don't know if it's still it's the same. Sco scholarship, the, the, um, the preservation of this work that goes back, you know, decades. Yeah. And recently, I, I came to learn that um, Phantom, so Phantom was captured by the Lincoln Center of Library in its, for, you know, its first year, like after it opened, because that's how the library does I it. I know what I'm doing tonight. 
<laughs> and it wasn't available to be seen until right. the show closes because you can't see it while the show's running because it's not a, it's it's not it shouldn't you know take the place of seeing something and it's really meant for study. So it was released last February, March, and you know it's like one of the most you know you might have to make a reservation to see it. I don't know. Um, but yeah, it's been released. So yeah, I I went and saw. I watched Parade when I was in like a freshman in school. I, I did like a lot. I, I tried to go every moment. I also snuck in to see Contact like 25 times in Act <laughs> Two because I found a secret way in that the ushers didn't catch me. Uh, but I I watched a ton of stuff and watched Parade like that. And I wish I had seen it a lot more recently because I was trying to like oh I I couldn't go back and watch it again when I found out I was going to get to do it at City Center, but. Uh, I vaguely remembered. I vaguely remembered it, so, but it had been a long time. Library, yeah, which is yeah. crazy. Which I haven't seen any of it. Uh, I would love to see. I think Spring Awakening is there, and I think I, I, Parade is there. I assume that they've captured that. Yeah, and these these are not available to be streamed and you know screened, and these these don't take the place of some of the commercial entities. These are really just for um, yeah preservation and scholarship. So. Um, the writing directing piece, so Christmas Carol, uh, when you started to work on that uh, with Jeffrey, you were, you were looking for a, the spine of the piece, uh, I heard you say, and uh, how, do, how do you balance the writer and director and create space in those, or is there space, are they inseparable? How do you manage that? Well, the, relationship that with one yourself? was a specific case because it was a one man show. I think, like, it was ultimately, it was prose. So yeah. I was more, even though I am, I did write it, I feel like I was more of an editor in that mm -hmm. particular instance with Jefferson and um, Susan Lyons, who is his, his partner. Uh, so that, you know, we were taking the book looking at the original text, looking at the, a version that Charles Dickens performed, actually, during his lifetime, uh, and, then, and then looking at what was interesting to us, and then also then what worked dramatically. So it kind of was this like multi-layered editing process. Um, but I mean, you know, I can't say I wrote A Christmas Carol. I just want to make that clear. <laughs> I very much Charles Dickens did. Um, <laughs> But uh, it was exciting to get to think about how to, how to make prose dramatic um, and find a spine in that. And for us, it was the, the telling of the ghost story. I mean, the, the original title of the book is A Christmas Carol or a Ghost Story in Prose of Christmas. There's a, there's a long title. And that the ghost story of, of what could you tell the, child or an adult at night that would scare the dickens out of them you know and, and how to keep that that was our kind of like through line is it any moment if the the text wasn't doing that we had to get rid of it now you say that's a one-man show as someone who well kind of kind of it's not real i mean what how <laughs> that stage was full i mean there were there were lots of people on that stage and there were you just couldn't see them Part, well, part of that was Jefferson's performance, absolutely, but part of it was also how, how did you create that sense of, I mean, it was a, a significant physical production. Yeah. So it was a, you know, it was major production in that sense, but there was something about the rhythm of the work or the way that you staged it that literally made me feel like there were all of those people on stage. Just yeah, uh, I mean, it was, luckily I have like the greatest actor alive doing it. I mean, it's, uh, he, he must take the credit for that. Uh, that Jefferson can, can make you believe that there are more than one people in a, in a uh, more than one person in a room. It's pretty eerie. <laughs> um, and, and that process really came together we kind of wrote a version of the script, sitting around a table, me and Jefferson and Susan, and said, okay, let's start here. 
and he read it, so we wanted to hear it and made sure it makes sen made sense aloud. And then I took it to the design team, and we spent a week in a cabin trying to scare each other and thinking about like what it could be, um, which was my favorite part of that process of like, oh, well, what if we do see the entire Fezziwig ball? You know, so there we did film right. people and. I played quite a few characters in projections in that show too. Mm -hmm. uh, like the Ghost of Christmas Future, you know, was sure. me with an iPhone in a closet, you know. Um, but we got to really look at each moment from a sort of synesthesiac, all mm -hmm. aspects thinking at once. So like sound was, our sound designer was talking about does the design from the very beginning and I think that is why it felt it felt so complete is that the design was quite it was like a full circle from the beginning as opposed to okay we have a play and now like we're gonna look at a set design and then sounds gonna come in later and then lights gonna put it on you know it wasn't a layer cake it was like a, a moose <laughs> I don't know what I'm saying well, <laughs> does that make sense <laughs> projections don't always achieve what you achieved it without, right? The, we, wanted the, to, we wanted people to not know there were projections. Mm -hmm. And there were like seven projectors and like the most LED ever. It was like so much, it, if you watch the show like from the, from above or from like a infrared camera, you couldn't believe it. There was like 12 people on stage all the time, mm -hmm. moving things and video happening and you know, but it was tr like an exercise in, okay, we have all these toys and no one can see them. Uh, which was a fun, I think, I'm articulating this for myself because I need to hear it, giving yourself a parameter to work within, kind of like at, at every point in the process, especially on that one, was really helpful for all of us. Like how can we, what, can, what is the least amount we can show people for the maximum effect? So that was kind of our guiding light there. Well, let's talk about collaborators, because you, you have a very wide circle of collaborators, and I sense that uh, community is, it, it continues to grow. And you have a, you are known for being like deeply loyal and having a very close community. How, how do you balance both of those things? How do you keep I mean, directors and choreographers oftentimes with the production pressures um, and just the, the way that you work, there's a, a core of folks that you develop a shorthand with that yeah. you begin to kind of understand and can push each other, but also keeping new people moving in. So how, how, do, you, how, how, does, how do you do that? I think you just have to like l see what the, the thing you're making wants first. It, it sort of tells you, and sometimes it tells you I, I want to be done in two weeks, <laughs> you know? And so you, you, you have a shorthand or you have a community or collaborators. You know, I have been working with a scenic designer my entire career who was my high school roommate. So uh, yeah, we went to school together since we were, we've been doing this since we were 16 and have, he's designed every piece of my work. So we very much share a brain in, you know, and we've worked together on most things. Um, but I think you just have to see what the piece wants and the, the people that you're working with want to be the right temperament for it. Kind of, you know, have the right aesthetic, be interested in, in the same goals and parameters that you do for the piece. Um, and, you know, share a work ethic and bedside manner that you do. You know, it's like there's, I, I don't want to like, be in some sort of like home where mom and dad are fighting in the room, you know, or they don't share the same religion. That, you know, you know what I'm saying as the, as metaphor. Um, but that so I think that's important. And then just like continuing to see as much work as possible and saying, oh, I loved what this person did. I can see that for this project working and. On every project, I think it's important that like there be something new, some new element, some new designer, some new collaborator, because that also like forces me to articulate myself and for myself in a way that I haven't before. Which I, th I had a great teacher at Juilliard named Becky Guy. 
anybody knows this teacher. She's an acting teacher, but an incredible director too. And she said, if you can fully articulate something, then you can do it. Yeah. I saw a, a, a flautist on Instagram yesterday said the same thing. If I can sing it, I can play it. I can do it. Yeah, so. Now, Hal Prince actually used to say that. You know, one is, uh, in every room there should be someone younger than him that he had not worked with. And he always gave credit to George Abbott for being the one who had told him that. That in every room there should be someone younger who you haven't worked with before. Absolutely. So, uh, now, the first time you worked with Lauren and Cree, co-choreographers, was that the first time you worked with co-choreographers yes. on a project? Yeah. And that was for Parade? That was on Parade, yeah. So how, how did that change? Well, I, they were introduced to me by a stage manager friend that I had worked with because his brother had worked with them and they had worked with Palabalas for quite a while. Um, and they were part of American Dream Study, this thing we did in the woods as performers um, and I just fell in love with them as a creative pair. He's a visual artist, she's an incredible m kind of math mind as well and uh, strategic mind so I just think they're an incredible pair um, and they, they bring so much understanding of the world that I don't have and come from such different places than I do that I, I just love working with them. And like, they are not precious about in their choreography feeling like people are noticing the choreography. They want the play to be the thing, um, which I, I've, I've certainly like butted heads with, with choreo choreography before because it feels like a separate event than the play where it feels like, a, oh, we're going to stop the action to, like, dance, and, and no, 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 I don't want to do that. And neither do they, and so we really get along there, and I just love work, working with them. So that was, so I, when I was looking for choreographers for Parade, I thought, oh, this could be really interesting, and I had seen the movement they had done, and I love what they're able to do in a sort of, pedest with pedestrian movement, especially. Like, they can make the real world kind of lock into this magic, magical movement at times that I think is really special. Um, and they're incredible with people. They're just really, companies love them, trust them. They've been perform. they've both been performers, they've performed together. Um, yeah. Well, this co-choreographing, co which is a, a um, happens more often than co-directing, but the, the working in collaboration, I mean, we're always changing the way we make this work, right? I mean, there's some leaps that happen, and then, but incrementally, um, the way things happen has been evolving. But this is a, this is starting to gain some traction or be a little more common. And so they were both, well, they're co-choreographers. You're going to be doing some co-directing. Yeah, so I'm about to co-direct my first co-directed show. <laughs> <laughs> is that, that is like the preparation is that is that it's a lot of texting it's a lot of calling it's a lot of mind meld it's a lot of like checking in and saying do you agree tell me when you don't uh, I'm so I'm working with an incredible director named Tanache uh, Tanache Bolden who is the artistic director of the Atlanta Alliance and we're about to work on a project together and we like have a you know every day even if we have nothing to talk about we we say hi and check in and She's pinned on my t texts, you know, yeah. what I, you know what I mean? Um, and I have no idea how it's going to go, but we're just going to keep communicating about it every day. How is today? What do we want to change about tomorrow? Because any relationship is just that. It's like two things in relation to each other, and that will change every second, depending on like the temperature of the room. So, um, but I'm so excited to do it because, again, it's like an opportunity for me to learn from someone I really respect. and. Um, yeah, and and in the sense of that mind, you know, you say mind melt was the the uh, because when you go in the room, and we're going to go in the room here in just a minute. I don't know how we're doing the time, but because um, I want to talk about inside the room, but going into the room in a co relationship, you're setting it up with the expectation that there's a mind melt. Yeah, yeah, and 
But I, I think, luckily, I, I kind of like things to go wrong a lot, <laughs> which people really find frustrating, especially writers um, that I work with. Why are, why, that's not what it is, or, you know. And I think that, like, getting it wrong numerous times is actually so much more beneficial than getting it right. It's like we rehearse something over and over and over again, and, like, if we just try to do it the same, the, or the right way every time, we're actually not learning anything. Which is kind of, everyone knows this, but to, to like actually do it in practice is stressful because like especially you've got a whole bunch of people watching something fail. Um, uh, but I think that is helpful in that too of like, okay, well let's, let's explore everything even if it's wrong. So my idea might be wrong, let's, what's your idea? And let's try that next. Um, so I think it's just allowing yourself to, I'm, I'm excited to <laughs> kind of fail with someone else for a little bit should be fun um, we'll see and it might be messy I probably but I think that will actually that's probably a good thing that we don't quite know how it's gonna go neither of us have co-directed but we know that we respect each other and we have the same like core values as people um, and how we want to treat artists how we want to approach the work in terms of what the what the work actually becomes or is at any given moment, who knows? But that's okay. I don't think. And I mean, every rehearsal process I get the day before, and I'm in a complete panic of like, I actually have no idea what I'm doing. I don't know. It, I haven't staged it. I don't know what it's going to be, and it always works out okay, kind of. I, I think. I mean, I don't know, but it does. Okay. I mean, you, you all feel this, right? It's like that's just what happens. You you can't. You actually can't because it is, we are working in a collaborative medium. So the fact that I'm, I'm always co-directing. So this is no different. It's just like, lucky me, I get like tanache at like saving the day. So setting up your room. Um, Tables, chairs, <laughs> a lot of tape. Do you have any ritual, structure, disciplines? And I'm curious about how, how those may have changed over time. Certainly, uh, the past number of years uh, have um, been, there's been a lot of upheaval in our industry. And I'm talking about both you know, the pandemic, uh, the long overdue cry for racial justice and more attention paid to equity. Um, as well as you know, coming on the heels of the Me Too movement. So certainly, the last five six years have been hard, but and important. And but your first room, let's just say the first room you set up was Spring Awakening. Yeah. Which probably was different to set up, but I'm just curious about whether setting up that room, what you've what you've carried through from how you have set up that room. Yeah, I I started doing something on that show because I felt it was important for like so often we get to know the play before we know each other when we come into rooms it's like we come in on the first day and we immediately dive into the thing and then we're forced to kind of get to know each other and each other's processes outside of the hours of rehearsal because there's never there are never enough um, so I started this thing that I do every day please use it take it I don't know if it's worthwhile or not but we stand in a circle, um, hopefully a good circle, not an oval, <laughs> and, um, and I say every day, does anyone have anything to share that has nothing to do with the play? And we will spend as long as we want there. Because it actually lets us like, it always has something to do with the play too, things people talk about. We get to know each other, we get to like let out the thing that was kind of going to be sitting was going to be the rock in our shoe of whatever we're trying to do. Like, I'm frustrated. I, you know, somebody vomited on my shoes on the subway. You said it, it's done. You can, like, let it go. So it kind of, like, clears the way. We get to meet each other, know each other. Gratitude is always expressed in some way, I've noticed, which is helpful. <laughs> um, and then we can, then it's like, okay, we've, we've like, swept off, we've, we've, wiped off the table, now we can begin to like prepare the meal. So that's something that, is, that has carried through that I do every single day, even in times of great time crunch. 
Um, that's one thing, yeah. And how do you move in the room? So it's not, you know, directors will, you know, sit at a table, some are up and down, some I'm kind of everywhere. say anything. Yeah, I'm kind of everywhere and like, I, I, I interrupt people probably too much. Um, <laughs> and I think I'm often like really concerned with like things that people are like, why? I, I was speaking, he's not watching me. And I'm like over there talking to somebody like who's dealing with a prop in the back, you know, because it's like, yeah, we, we're going to rehearse this a thousand times. Like, I'm not like, we're also rehearsing the, the guy rolling the cigarette. That's being rehearsed too. So I think it's just about being able to like, again, look at things from different perspective. And sometimes I'll watch the scene from the back of the room which really makes people feel strange. Um, or the sight, you know, you just like try to see it from all sides um, to, give, to shake up my own expectation of what a scene might be. Um, yeah, that, I hope that answers that. That uh, absolutely um, answers that. And sometimes I'm just sitting at the table. You know what I mean? If it, like, at a certain point, I need to like see it from the audience's perspective for whatever reason, but honestly, like, it's going to change in tech, so who cares? That's what I always say. It's like, I, I, I get so, you know, then when I start to get really like, could you take a step to, I'm like, this is pointless. What am I doing? Let's just like, let's actually, let's actually fuck it up a little bit in, while we're in the rehearsal room, because like, it actually is all, it is all going to change, I, in, inevitably. How do you press your collaborators to move through things that either um, you know, might not yet be difficult for them or from their perspective, but you know you've got to go through to get, you know, it's rigor, the expectation of excellence, the, 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 there's a challenging that often needs to happen, right? There's a comfort zone mm -hmm. uh, in doing work, particularly a lot of the work that you do is, is you know, has got a belly to it, so to speak, has got some real internal life stuff. Um, and you, ha what are some strategies to kind of push collaborators, be they actors or other collaborators? Push them, th can you? Um, well, some of this work that we do in the theater is hard. Yeah. And, and sometimes it's, it's hard to push people to reach the next level, to push them through. Oh, their, okay, their, yes. Their spaces of comfort. I think I can like, answer this now. Yeah, I, I think I often encourage people to, to do to go too far. Like, I'm gonna say like, do, do more than like, go way too far. Overact, go, go over the line. Because again, going back to this thing about naturalism, which we're all like chasing at every moment of the day because we watch HBO, mm -hmm. like, <laughs> it, that we limit ourselves always. When we try, when we try to like be believable, I think, or do, and so, so it's saying, okay, this time, cool, uh, this time, you know, everyone like overact as much as you can, or you know, actors or you know, or with a design team, like, okay, come up with something totally different. We know we're not going to use it, but it will like reveal something. Mm -hmm. Because it, and it always does, like especially with the actors, always. People are like, enough, I think actors, and we all are so afraid of being labeled as like over dramatic or too much or cheesy or all of these bad words when actually like we need to do that. We need to like go to 200. So because otherwise we would have only, if we want to get to 100, like we'll never get to 100 if we never get above 85. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So that's kind of from every department. It's like, no, no, this, with the sound cue, like make it ridiculous. Give, make it the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Like go for it, make it too loud. I want it to be wrong. And we'll find something in that. Um, again, some people, this really stresses a lot of people out. <laughs> Collaboration with producers. Um, speaking of. Speaking of. <laughs> speaking of making people crazy. But, yeah. you know, so, so inside the room, uh, you know, directors, choreographers, they're leading a process, and they've got a collaborator who is often in the room, but not always in the room, and it's a different relationship, the collaboration, and there's still some leading of, 
producers, but how, how do you collaborate with, with, your, with producers that you work with? I mean, I sort of acknowledge that ultimately this, it's, their, it's their show. It's, you know, more than it is anybody's. Mm -hmm. It's their show, and that means it is the audience's show. It is their audience's show or ho what they want, hope the audience might be. So I think it's sort of kind of like, that helps me kind of take my ego out of it a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, and that too, that again is a parameter and a, and a box to kind of fit within or a, a you know, it's like, okay, what, what show are we all trying to make? And I, I've had wonderful, I've had great experiences. I mean, I would so much rather, the, the times when I have difficult, experiences with producers are when they say like go do anything you want like the worst that's the worst <laughs> like tell me you have six dollars 45 minutes you know what I mean and because then it's like okay I know what I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna build the house you want me to to build but it's like they're I don't know I have a great respect for them because they're making it happen it wouldn't be happening without them so I don't know if that answers that question, yeah, no. but I, I try to, and luckily I think in that from, I try to like overstate that I want to fit within their, their vision, you know, and then it, but if there are times that I don't agree with it, I'll say, well, well, I don't understand why you, why you want that or why you're asking me for this. Usually I do understand what it is but to be able to have that conversation is important to just say like I you know tell tell me what tell me the tools I have because um, that actually helps me and ultimately I think it it relieves producers too because they're just always worried about money always can you imagine yeah I mean it's got it's got to be like so like let's all help each other it's kind of how I like to work with producers being like I know this is really stressful <laughs> Let's spend less money somehow. Let's see if we can do it. You know, I don't know. Audiences, you just referenced audiences. Um, your relationship to the audience. I mean, we hear so much about what we think the audience wants, what the audience doesn't want, whether the audience wants anything at all. Um, you know, what is your relationship to the idea of audiences, and what do you think is happening right now in the, the theater with the relationship with audiences? I don't know. I kind of feel like I am the like I'm a I am a part of that audience in a way. So I try to like I don't try to imagine the audience as something totally separate from what Michael wants to go see. Because like at the end of the day, I don't want to be making things that I don't like. So I kind of just, I am a member of this audience and yes, I might like certain things more than others, but, but I want, I am going to the theater to have a communal experience, which means I like, I don't want just something made built just for me. I want it built for we. So I think that's kind of how I view it. And you just try to give people like, a exciting, surprising, shocking, and reflective thing. I don't know. I mean, like, I, I don't think, I think you won, you like, you go see a play. So v for me, it has to be visually exciting. So that is like, people go see a play, they say that phrase. Um, they want to be they want to be surprised because everyone likes to be surprised. They want to, and they want to like, I think we, whether they know it or not, they, they want to be challenged a little bit, but entertained at the same time. So I, I think audiences are great. Love them. <laughs> keep them coming. Let's keep them, um, yeah. Yeah, they'll stay. Um, we're gonna open it up for some questions. Questions? Yeah, can I? There, there are a couple that I got. I know not right. everyone got to put their questions down, but I got a couple that I thought would be helpful that would be good for this group. And then if there's more time, then we can, you know, go to some of the questions right. that folks have in the audience. But um, someone asked, um, 
if you have advice for directors looking to transition from other work mediums like opera into musical theater or Broadway work? Like how it's like kind of how do you transition between different mediums work? I think just go be a, become a fan of the thing you want to do first. I'm working with a, a composing team right now who is they've, they've never like had never like seen a musical. And now that, you know, and I was like, okay, I just, I wrote down like all my favorite things they could watch online to watch and, and tell them to see as much as they can. And that's my, and now they're, they love it. And so they're able to like both have reference, but still maintain what makes their artistic voice special in the process. So I would say dive into being a fan and bring what you do well from where you're coming from. Um, and ask for help in the places you don't understand. Because everyone is entering a new situation like that at every moment. It's been, it's been like, there's no good answer to this. It's been like, sometimes it's been a company member I've worked with who is who I can tell is like, I see that you're interested in the other perspective. Um, it's been recommendations. It's been someone has come up to me at an event and said, hey, I want to assist you or send me an email or I have called our incredible union and asked for suggestions at times. So it's really, um, you know, but it wants to feel again, it like, just like in, they are a vital part of the creative team. So it wants to be the right temperament and the right fit for the project and for the right for, and for the rest of the team. It's such a challenge, I'm just going to say, it's such a challenging craft in that way and in some ways choreographers it's also challenging but you can see their work in a different way. For, for directors finding a way in, there's not, speaking of paths, there's not like a path in, there's yeah. no auditions, there's no portfolio, there's no it's, it's, it's hard. Yeah, and to like show what you can do requires like a ton of money. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It like ki it kind of, you know, I mean, I guess not always, but it's, it's not like a sketchbook. You, you need to actually make theater and people need to see it. So that's, that's tricky. I also think like sometimes if I'm looking for an assistant on something, I'm not always looking for someone who I think is going to like direct the play the best. Actually, that's not the skill that the, that the assistant needs to have. The assistant needs to be able to communicate with the different teams well, to put notes together, to have an eye on things that I don't, but basically can like understand my vision and and figure out how to help me help help me achieve it and all departments together. So, you know, often I think that like. Being an assistant director is a wonderful step as a director, but I don't know if you're getting much directing. You're not really directing a lot. So I think there's, that's just one avenue towards being a director. That's what I would say. Honestly, like shadowing the lighting, working on the lighting team might give you as much or more of an experience of what you might actually be doing directing a show. Um. Well, going back to the like go too far thing, yeah. that, like me being, I realized after I went back, to, I hadn't acted in a while and then I did King Lear. And when I went into tech, I was like, oh my God, I, can't, I, I forgot this. And I was thinking about it in a way and I was like, why, wh why do we tell actors like to don't think about how you look like be uninhibited, like be as free as possible. And then could you go sit in front of that mirror for half an hour before the show and look at yourself? Crazy. I was like, what is going on? This is nuts. Cover the mirrors up, burn the place down. So, you know, it, I, in doing that, I was like, oh, part of my job is to actually be a remover of fear. Because again, going back to Kristen Hange, that is, that it, fear is the inverse of love. So let's get rid of, let's, that's kind of like, I realized that from being an actor, knowing how scary it is to be out there and even having like 
directed Broadway shows and then going back and stepping on stage before in front of an audience that first night, I was like terrified. So that having that empathy is helpful and remembering that like everyone's just trying to kind of clear a path to letting their shoulders relax, to, to breathing, to actually looking and listening to each other. And that if like that has been what has helped me, I, I, that's something I've realized from being a performer that like someone actually has to help you do that because you're, you can't uh, do that by yourself usually as an actor. Well, I kind of just fell into working at the Alliance. Uh, I did a play called Maybe Happy Ending there a few years ago before the pandemic and I had an incredible experience. I loved all the people there. And so when uh, Preacher's Wife was looking for a home, I was like, I really should be in Atlanta. Like, I love that theater. The crew is awesome. Um, the stage itself is beautiful. The food is great in Atlanta. Um, you know, I, I think like that's that's partially why it's just you 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 find a home and you you know how it works and and um, you you get to know the people there in all the departments and they're all really good folks at that theater as there are in many theaters. But I, I would say that the, uh, the producers kind of took the lead with that one. I just said yes, please. Yeah, I, I think I would say again, like don't only focus on, try not to only focus on assistant directing because so much of what the skill I think of being a director is like budgeting, working with designers, understanding automation, production management, um, uh, casting, uh, working with stage, stage management. Like the, you actually like, Directing is like one piece of that pie and the rest is like the big part of the pie. So like go eat the rest of the pie would be my advice. Like I interned as li with lighting departments and stuff like that so that then now I can like have conversations about moving lights and with programmers and just get to know every person in the building and what they do and because then you'll be able to have a common language with them and your work will be smoother and people will notice that and then want you to lead the ship because you can get from A to B faster, probably. Yeah, the director being the sort of central artist who actually touches everyone in the collaboration. Now certainly the, the text is the foundation, yeah. but the director touches everything. And I think sometimes we we forget that. Yeah, I mean, like, I'm on, you know, it's like, it's like people are like, what are you doing on this Zoom? I'm like, I'm talking about wigs for three hours <laughs> is what I'm doing. You know what I mean? Because that's, that is part of it. And it's all in detail. So like, get it, get in as detailed in each, each facet as you possibly can. Wouldn't you say you don't always know who is who? So you don't know if that person who you think only does that and may not be a path might actually be someone who is different than you think they are and might be helpful in the next yeah. step. Yeah. And and just ask someone, what are you doing? What are, what are you what are you how do you do this thing? You know, if there's ever a break uh, in a process or a time when you can, you know, <laughs> I have a bad habit of like sneaking backstage and talking to the crew to learn about what's happening because then I'm able to like understand so much better what's happening up front. Um, it's not a bad habit, it's just a habit, uh, which well, I the like. the producers know you do that, and so then other producers know. I mean, yeah. directors who are strong collaborators and inclusive in that way, people know that. Yeah, it's not like a pyramid, it's a circle. Other questions? Yes. And then 
Jarrell Henderson, I'm a director. I just wanted to know if I could give you my card. <laughs> Absolutely. Awesome. Thank you. Yes. Are you friends with Jody McFadden? I am. Okay. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> good card. Thank you. Just in case you're looking for another co director. Yeah, yeah, good to know. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Um, thank you so much for doing this talk. This was awesome. And I wanted to say that in so many of your productions, I felt that there's this like incredible path of innovation that gets to a center that feels like a heart. And it's not like um, gadgets and tricks that get you somewhere new, but like some exciting path that gets you somewhere you already know, which is like as a director, feels like such an exciting thing you're making. And I'm wondering since you have like figured out how to do that, um, if you have any like big ambitions as a director that you're like, this is what I want to reach next that I can't figure out how to do, either like in your process or in your impact on the industry or like the type of show you want to make, but uh, any secret dreams? I'm, I'm really excited about working on new work, new writing now, and that is so scary to me because like, Everyone's like, you're such a, you're, you're a great director. And I'm like, well, I've worked on really amazing pieces of writing. You know what I mean? Like, I started with a huge head start. You know? It's like, I, <laughs> I, I've, like, been able to work on my favorite musicals on Broadway. And now I'm working on new material. And that's really scary. So I'm excited to, and, and scared to work on that and figure out where my what my place is in that because it is there is the play that is the writers there's the production that is all of ours and people will come to the writing via the production so I'm cautiously you know I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic that I'm gonna know how to do this well but I, d I have no idea so I think I'm really excited by the opportunity that I'm embarking on three new musicals like in a row starting in two weeks like to get to do that and and it's scary because I of course like people are, I'm worried what people are gonna think you know so I guess I'm just gonna have to try to remove fear for myself um, but I want to make new work that becomes work that people want to revive you know and and help writers create things that that will live on past what my production of that will be mm -hmm. um, and I'm also really interested in like creating theater experiences that are um, like play with form and play with play with nonverbal theater I'm interested in and and uh, so that's one thing I'm like scared I, w I want to like do dance theater <laughs> we'll see how that goes I don't know so that's one thing I'm interested in doing is like being able to like make something that you don't need to know any any specific language to understand and enjoy or you could have any sort of education um, for young people for adults that, that can come to something and like take away story without necessarily needing to have a prere prerequisite set of tools coming in. Mm -hmm. So that's like, that's my, that's my big goal in the future. Don't know how that's gonna happen. <laughs> we'll see. And I wanna work with puppets. <laughs> so I'm working on a few things with puppets that I'm very excited about because I love puppets. Yeah. <coughs> um, so The Lost Boys feels like property where the fans of the film are going to be expecting big visual effects and it's different than Parade or What's on the Side. Is that an attraction of the property? Is it daunting? Is it a combination? It's a combination of the two. Yeah, The Lost Boys, which is a, based on an 80s vampire film by that Joel Schumacher made, um, I'm directing. And it certainly like requires like, you know, the stage directions read like, he flies over the audience and is impaled by a stake and <laughs> burst into flames. You know, that's certainly terrifying. 
for me. Um, so, because I also like, you know, the things that I grew up loving. I mean, I like Phantom of the Opera, like how Prince was my king. So I want to like make, make something that is visually thrilling while not distracting from the beauty and the heart of the piece. So it's like this, it's kind of this like dance on the edge of a blade of not wanting to, to have one thing at the expense of the other. Uh, but that is, that's one that I think is probably not, you know, uh, minimal. <laughs> Oh hey! Down there, um, Center for Puppetry Arts. Check it it's out. I know I know I know right where it is. You yeah, <laughs> it's amazing. But, it's a block. Um, it's a block away. Convenient. Yeah, exactly. It's a perfect little square. Um, one of the shows that comes to my mind whenever like I talk to people about like what to start, what I wanted to start in directing is like your production is from everything to me. Um, what was something that felt like it was your inspiration for like oh maybe I want to direct rather than my different avenues like writing. I don't think I'm like actually that great at those other things. I, I think there are people who do those things much better and that like do those things. And I, I don't, and, and can do them kind of without anything or anybody else around. I think what I, I'm learning that my gift is like working with people and, and like helping them get from 85 to 100 and so I think that's what of like pulling all those pieces together and being making sure that everyone is communicating that everyone is telling the same story um, I that seems to me w that's why I wanted to do it it's it, not that not that I w does that make sense yeah 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 Absolutely. Can everybody hear that? Ever hear that? Uh, just ha is she, uh, so you said if have I worked in a situation where the parameters, which I touted as being helpful, uh, seemed insurmountable, and the answer is yes. And sometimes you have to like unplug the computer and plug it back in. In those moments, you have to like you have to literally go for a walk, breathe, like get a new perspective. Sometimes in those moments, like if it's in the theater, I'll like go stand upstairs or like move to a new place, like physically move to, to actually say, oh, I've been looking at something from this way. Of course, I'm not going to be able to like change n my idea of what it can be, especially if it's a drastic change. But it always it is always better because you ha you s your work doesn't go away if you have to change. It's just there and then has to like really work in the new parameters. Um, but it's not easy. It's like, it's like painful in those moments to go through. But it kind of always is better. Always. I don't know why. It's really weird, but it's always better. Or at least like you have to say that because life is short and we're all going to die. <laughs> so it has to be better. So we might as well pretend it is. Hi. Um, I'm very curious. Um, I had seen it was announced that you're attached to direct High Noon. And if you, that project, if, what drew you to that project and what's your. What, what is. High Noon? Yeah, no, but the last thing, just the very last thing you what said. What is your. What, what attracted you? Oh, what attracted me to that project? Well, I'm from, I'm from West Texas, so Westerns were, are big, and I. You know, everyone uh, played pretend gunfight as a kid. So something about that, like really, mm -hmm. I think on a weird base level, attracted me to it. Um, it's also just like an incredible morality mm -hmm. tale, which I'm, it's kind of a theme. And I think most things I'm attracted to are about consequence. Mm -hmm. um, and that is certainly one. And it's, yeah, I wanted to work with this writer. Um, and the idea of like doing a play that is like all 
verbiage until the last 10 minutes when it's like a shootout. I was like, well, I've never done that. This is going to be interesting. I usually hate violence, working on violence on stage. It's really hard for me. I, I'm, I get very, I'm violence averse. So this felt like, well, that should be scary. Mm -hmm. That's, uh, you know, is there, is there a way that that can be, that I can break through that fear of violence mm -hmm. on stage? The second part of the question, if I may. Um, and then, because this is an adaptation at first, are you working closely with your vision? With yes, writer? I sat like, next to Eric Roth on his floor for a month as he wrote his first draft, and, and it's his first play. So Eric Roth is writing, has written, High Noon, and he just wrote Killers of the Flower Moon, he wrote Forrest Gump, he, I mean, he wrote Dune, he's amazing. Um, but I'd never written a play, so, uh, you know, I just sat next to him and held his hand and kept saying, write anything you want to. <laughs> Whatever you describe, it will be different than what you think it will be. Like, sure, hor 20 horses, write it. You know, so that, it's been really fun to get to work with him and, and try to take his, like, v impulse as a screenwriter, mm -hmm. um, and kind of boil it down to what is the what is the metaphor, what is the like gut impulse of this, and then how can we do that on stage in a way that is actually possible. We're going to have to wrap up. I just do want to say thank you, Michael. And going back to what I said when we began, which is this idea of directors and choreographers gathering together to share um, knowledge. Uh, to be in community, to talk about the craft, uh, and that you have taken this time when you have like all of those projects in your craft. I wasn't even thinking of High Noon, I was thinking of... Yeah, me neither, Sky thanks for that. And the, <laughs> Fly and the Lost Boys, I mean, I was thinking of uh, all of those things. So that you have all of those in your head and your heart, and you found time to do this with us. I it's really it's helpful, it. I mean, anytime I, like, I'm forced to articulate thing. I mean, this has been like really helpful for me actually. So I just want to thank all of you for being here, asking these questions. I want to thank you. I, I want to thank our interpreters. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, yeah, it's, it's also, like you said, it is a very lonely, isolating thing. So, you know, it's like once in a while I like, you know, drunk dial Joe Mantello when I'm freaking out, but like, you know, it's, that's rare, you know, because it is, I think as, uh, for those of you who are directors or becoming directors, it's, there is a, it can become incredibly isolating. And so like finding ways in which you can articulate to other people who are doing it, ask questions, how do you deal with this? I've just been trying to reach out to directors cold and say, hey, could, could I like go to coffee with you? And can we just talk about like, what how you do it you know and i think some people are like don't steal my stuff but still you know stealing is and that's a everything great piece of <laughs> I, think I, I, I find i hear scary from directors and choreographers all the time that they i i reached out i sent a note i, I mean there's a great story marshall mogram dodge talks about writing a note to um bob fossey who like turned around and wrote on back yeah. Or Lonnie Price, who at you know the age of no one's ever said no. Yeah, they don't. Like you know, actually, because it's so rare, said, someone another director was is, like wants yeah. to talk about it. Hal said, "Lonnie, come on in." He was like 19 years old. Come in the office, we'll talk. So I do think, you know, picking up the, yeah. Yeah, and just creating like a circle of people. I've been trying for a few years to like have a have a like group of people who can come together and like once a month you know, talk about how, how it's going for them and share stories and see how we can help each other because there's not enough of that. So thank you for, yeah. for being part of that. Well, this is great. Everybody have a lovely afternoon. We're going to let Michael get to his next Thanks, everybody. Nice to meet you.